are back. Chuck Fletcher's not. You're listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington, and joining me today, Mr. Kevin Durso. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin, we're starting off today's show. Where were you? Where Where were you the last time a general manager was fired? A, a Philadelphia Flyers general manager was fired in Philadelphia. So you're having me go back to Hextall. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> I mean, it was a long time ago at this point. It was over five, it was five years ago at this point. So, um, you know, the specific day where was I? I was working in some office building somewhere, and, <laughs> and, and, and I had barely gotten to work and realized that my day was going to be a total whirlwind. Um, overall, work was secondary for the day. <laughs> overall time period? Um, yeah. You know, I still remember the game that was the breaking point for the Hextall era, which was it was they lost six nothing in Toronto, and I. I was just. Who had the hat trick? Andreas Johansson. Andreas, Andreas Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Andreas Johansson, and I. My favorite thing about that game is about three quarters of the way through the first period, they're heading to a commercial break, and Jim Jackson, just in absolute disgust, tosses <laughs> his headphones down. They don't mute his mic in time. You hear his headphones clatter onto the desk, and then they cut to commercial. And- Andreas Janssen's finest moment in his <sighs> NHL career because he's been bounced around. Because he beat Peter Morozik three times at five hole. Was that Morozik? I don't think yep. that was Morozik. Yep. Um, no, I thought he was gone by then. I thought that was... Um... Oh, it was somebody crazy. who had it was somebody who had been a goaltender for the Marlies. I'm aware of that, and he had well, played with Janssen, and Janssen well, here's knew the him. Thing. And Janssen well, beat him five hole three times. Here, well, here's the one. Th- here's the one thing I distinctly remember about that season, anyway, because that was three weeks before Carter Hart made his debut, which means that was the year of eight goalies. Yep. Yeah, so it was so for all I, so anybody could have been goalie in that season. <sighs> like, like for God's sakes, Mike McKenna got to start that year. He did. He did. So um, you know that was and, a and, fun and, year. And by the way, no, no disrespect to Mike McKenna, who on Twitter is one of the legends. Follows you're gonna have. He's really good. Legend. I love list, like listening to him talk and 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 his breakdowns on Twitter. He's great at that type of stuff. But I mean, it just goes to show you the level that they had to go to to. Ice a goaltender. It was pretty crazy. Um, so, well, that was three weeks later, which means that Carter Hart three weeks after that, and also that was after a coaching change. So Dave Haxtell was out, and uh, Scott Gordon was in on the interim basis. And for the record, um, we don't think that's going to happen this time around. I'm pretty sure. Oh, not with a coach. I don't <laughs> no. think. No. Um, uh, uh, not after you get a confirmation that, oh, yeah, we've met, and we're both on the same page, and this is where it's going to go. No, I think John Tortorella is. I've said all along he's been the safest guy in the organization, and I think that that rings true after this past weekend. No doubt about that. Um, no, so for me, and I kind of to- I told this story a little bit when I was on O and B last week that from the time that you know around the time that Chuck Fletcher got hired, which was December third, tw- uh, two thousand eighteen, so that was a week after Hextall got fired. Um, I got engaged on December seventh of that year. So my head's racing in 20,000 directions. I mean, and it, like, like picture, if you will, like I said, I'm working in some like random office building in, you know, at the time or whatever. Like I, I have another, you know, like another gig I'm doing during the course of the day or whatever. So the day Hextall gets fired, I'm obviously now I'm distracted. The day Fletcher gets hired, I'm distracted. And I'm certainly distracted the day that I'm going to propose to my now wife. So... You know, my right. head was racing in 20,000 different directions multiple days. And then, oh, by the way, you were two, a busy weeks, man. two weeks after Fletcher got hired was when the coaching change happened and when Carter Hart's getting called up. So it's like, OK, all these things are happening at once. It was three weeks of just craziness. So Chaos. that's where I was the last time a GM for the Flyers was fired. So the last time that a GM for the Flyers was fired, the last time Ron Hextall uh, left the Philadelphia Flyers organization, uh, we had actually just we had just wrapped the podcast. So if you've been listening for a long time, and I don't know how many OG listeners are still here, but uh, if you are, we appreciate you, by the way. Uh, the first run of the show had just come to a conclusion. Uh, we had just wrapped our hiatus show. Mm-hmm. Um, we were taking a break. Mike's wife was pregnant with, I believe, their second child. Um, you know, things were a little busy. We decided we were going to take a bit of a break. 
That show ships on Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. And you got hit with the classic Monday news drop. Monday morning news drop, baby. Ron Hextall's gone by 10 a.m. And that's e- like this is even how yep. our this is how our text chain goes, where we ha- we get excited about the fact that oh it, it happened on a Friday. Okay, we'll stick. With, you know, Perfect. Sunday record is fine now. We're recording on Sunday evening. The show's gonna go right out. Go out right after it's done. Even doing Sunday evening worked out because Danny Briere spoke on Sunday morning, which yep. was perfect. Like it's like Chef's kiss for all the stars aligning for when we were going to record today. And we will get into the Danny Briere comments as we get along. We sure. have a lot to get. To oh, today. there's a lot to get into with Danny um, Briere for sure. So, in case you missed it, I cannot imagine we're breaking news to anybody here. The, the big story the, today the, is... Right. Chuck Fletcher is no longer the general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers. Correct. Uh, he was relieved of duty on Friday morning. Uh, pretty much first thing, open business. Um, so we're not really surprised that the move happened. It's something we've been right. talking about on this show for 18 months at this point. Oh, yeah. Um, but things have really reached a fever pitch over the recent weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Not trading JVR is not why Chuck Fletcher got fired. Correct. Um, it might not even really be the straw that broke the camel's back. They might have even decided before that. Mm-hmm. But that, and then combined with Chuck Fletcher being booed at the town hall meeting the following day, which we didn't even really talk about all that much last week, uh, that combination of events, that 48 hours, at a certain point, it's, it, it's, it's doing a mercy to the guy. Like how, how long do you expect him to sit up there and just get hammered? Right. On the internet, at mm-hmm. games, at town hall meetings. I am positive when he's out in public. I know Philadelphia. And at a certain point, just do the guy a favor and let him go. Let him go be a right. senior advisor somewhere else because he's a Nepo baby and he's going to get another job immediately. <laughs> or the second he wants to, let's put it that way. He'll get a cushy little tiny little role somewhere where he can just collect a salary and go watch some hockey. And then in a couple of years when people forget about what an ab- abomination this rain was. And trust me, we'll be breaking down the laundry list. Well, the reason why you're bringing that up, too, is because it's not we're not that far removed from like, well, we're not that far removed from the trade deadline, but we're not that far removed from the news coming out of Nashville that David Poyle was going to retire and Barry Trotz is going to become the general manager there, which which was a shift. Yeah, that's a changing of the guard in Nashville. I mean, Poyle's oh, been the massive. general manager the entire time. He's, they he's their only general, general manager. manager. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, but when, that's, when you talk about building a team, whew. but that's like that's one of the storylines that I've seen a lot in the last several days. Is okay, Nashville, Philadelphia. Who's next? Because there's always a who's next. Somebody, you know, I, I think it was John Tortorella who said on Saturday, kind of pregame, when talking about, because that was his first real chance kind of to the media to react to what had happened. Right. He even said, you know what? Everybody gets fired. We've all been there. We all get fired. And, and you know, like, which it's the truth. You know, it is the truth. Sure. And, John and knows. It, which, which means that, you know, to your point, He'll get another opportunity probably somewhere in some capacity, but also that's why the questions become who's next? What team goes this far next to, you know, because most of the time when somebody changes something, we see it, it's the coach, it's the coach, it's the coach. And I even had this conversation in the press box recently at a game talking about what coach, you know, because Tortorella is pretty secure in his role. We've said that all along. Yeah. So, you know, he's pretty much the safest guy in the organization. So, but what teams are going to, you know, at the end of the season, like we see all the time, what teams are going to pull the plug and go, you know, we got to go in a different direction. And you talk about it from two different angles, the teams that continually struggle and don't get much further, like they're not making the playoffs, so they're not getting where they want to go. And which teams make the playoffs, but don't get far. And, oh, it's always this. It's This is the peak with this coach, so we got to change it, right? Like like Toronto comes up all the time. We heard this last year with Toronto. You know, how many more first-round exits do you get before, you know, hey, Sheldon Keefe, that's as far as you're ever going to take it, I guess, so you're out. You know, that kind of stuff. We talk and we talk well, about and that. There's, and the there's time. a reason Kyle Dubas hasn't been signed to a contract extension going even higher in the organization, Oh, yeah. Oh, I hear you. And that's, that's – but that's the thing. So – 
people get fired all the time. And so it's a kind of natural thing to look at it and go, okay, Nashville, Philadelphia, who's next? And there will be, there will be somebody who's next at some point. And that's when you start like, let's put it this way. What's one of the other teams where there's a lot of noise around general manager? Pittsburgh. About, I was going to say, are you talking about the cross-state rival? For Pen- yeah. Pittsburgh Penguins? I mean, there has been. You have you can't ignore it. So, it, you know, is that the Oh, the next... fans are not happy with right. Don Hextall. Is that, the, is, is that who's next? It could be. You never know. So, like, that's the Did, point. So, didn't he just get hired, like, within the last 12 months? Yeah, but they – okay, but here's the Man. thing. They've got that dynamic, that dynamic. I know. Thing, and we're going to certainly get into this because it's, it's, it, it's that – President and general manager split up, you know, and you know, you know. Look, I I don't know where I don't know where Brian Burke's mind is with that situation because we don't ever hear any. I, I don't think we really have ever heard much from him. He really very much is doing the president of hockey ops role and kind of probably staying out Quite of the way. Quite frankly, the quietest he's ever been. Right, probably you know, <laughs> kind of staying out of the way and probably just doing the report to ownership kind of deal. Right, but it's but it's obvious. It seems I mean, like it's Hextall ship. Oh yeah, but it's obvious that it's not exactly sturdy. And no, and the fans are supremely unhappy, and their results on the ice have been up and down. Um, they're currently on a bit of a hot streak, but before that, yeah. they were, looked like they were in danger of falling out of the playoffs entirely. Well, and they're in a unique situation. Let's not ignore that. You know, to go from what they're Ron- in a very short window and defined well, window, and that's the difference. Because when Ron Hextall was here, it was build it, build it, build it with the draft picks, draft picks, draft picks, and then and then it was pretty much going into that last year because what lines up? Chuck Fletcher had four, basically four and a half years, right? So what does that line up to? The JVR contract, which is which was the one kind of big, you know, let's make the big splash signing. That was the one big splash signing that Hextall went for, which very much felt like a push from elsewhere. Like, there's got to be a name. There's got to be a name. And then. And you overpaid you know, in a medium free agency class. Sure, for sure. And th- and that was kind of the tail end of it. And. But Hextall never had a team in Philadelphia that was trying to maximize the last of a championship core. No. Obviously, you know that's what he is. That's what he's got in Pittsburgh. It's you still. Look, he you still he got, was tasked with squeezing as many Stanley Cups out of Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Chris Letang as you can before the well one runs dry. And there's no bigger indication of that than giving the contracts that had to be made to Letang and Malkin when yep. the time came. And we didn't know what was going to happen with either of them going into free agency. And then we figured it out pretty quickly. Like, right. It's they're going to stay and they're signing long enough term that it, this is squeezing every ounce out of the core that you can. And, I, and, and it's not to say they don't have players, but but look at their deadline. Their deadline was Mikel Granlin, Nick Benino, and Benino's hurt now anyway. But like, you but you get the point. That. Right. right. But you but you get the point. It's. Depth go get, guys. Go right. get veteran depth guys. Not like it's not we're not talking about go build for your future here with it, you know, and trade off a, a veteran for a young player that you think can grow. Right. This was maximize the group that's left. And you know, the key with that is how much of that really falls on Hextall and how much, you know, like Sidney Crosby is still Sidney Crosby, let's be real. Right. Like the players can certainly dictate. Especially once their, it gets to the playoffs. Playoffs. With their abundance of skill, and Crosby's still got an abundance of it, and will until the will until he hangs him up, you know, because oh, he's gonna sure. very, he's going to very much, I think anyway, go out on his terms in a way that you know where he's not going to get to that point where the this looks he, horrible. The second he feels he's no longer elite, he has enough pride that he'll hang him up. Exactly, and, I, and he not could be one of those. I could see him doing uh, what was it the the Cal Ripken thing where he just uh, mid season he just eh, I'm done. And I mean, look, and he's very Sorry. much and he's very much done everything there is to possibly do. You know, the Stanley Cups, winning gold in the Olympics, like For sure. he's, scoring he's, the goal. Right, he's done everything. That, I mean, yeah. like, out, like outside of the next most obvious, which is G, the guy who's probably going to set the scoring record. You know. <laughs> He's he's the next most surefire Hall of Famer that's still right. playing. Let's right. not I spend mean, too much time on Sid here. No, I know. I'm. I, I know you love that I'm singing Sid's praises today. <laughs> not, not too much. Listen, I respect <laughs> them, but can we not? Come on. No, and let's get into the like again. Let's not bury the lead with this. The, okay, Chuck Fletcher. 
and by the way, real quick, why are we talking about opposing teams here? Just before we get to Rangers fans, there were some Rangers fans who've been celebrating this week. Like, listen, congratulations, eat your cookies. A, chill. You were here like two years ago. B, we're happy. You sh- you're cheering a decision that we're also cheering. Like, the logic just isn't there. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> this goes to show how oblivious I am to the rest of, like, the way that fans react to stuff. And oh, I yeah, Rangers know, fans didn't... are overjoyed. Oh, and... look at these miserable Flyers fans. Ha, ha, ha. No. Kind of surprised that this is a topic today and it wasn't last week when we talked about the Ranger game. Like, seriously, like, if you, Fair if, enough. If, if you wanted to dance on somebody's grave, the, the, t- the chance to do it was the week that you took over their own building. Truly. For the second time this season, no less. Well, like, I think that's what gave them the uh, <clears throat> stones to step sure, forward. Sure, maybe the way so. They did. Maybe um, so. But either way, uh, Chuck Fletcher is no longer in Philadelphia. Right. Uh, the statement. The, the, okay. fl- the, fly- the team released, um, you know, announcing the release, etc. There were already hints at looking towards the future. Um, there were sure. already hints at uh, a multi-year process, and we saw some things. Um, and when Danny Breer spoke this morning, obviously Danny Breer was named interim GM, um, he did back that up. Mm-hmm. He actually was... He just said the word rebuild. Yep. He just, here we are. We're going to be rebuilding. I wrote the article to kind of summarize that press conference and basically phrased it, went where his predecessor wouldn't. So he went there and said the word and said he's not afraid of the word and dove right into this. So, okay. I mean, listen, I don't know. Look, I don't know. It's tough to say where it goes from here completely. Today. We'll know a lot more about where it from here when when the last now it's what sixteen games when these last sixteen games are up, and yep. when and when we're you know once once all that's taken care of, then then we've got more to talk about. But oh, and really, by, then, by the way, the Flyers lost three games this week, and we probably don't really plan on talking about it all that much. So, <laughs> no, maybe we'll do maybe we'll do our Connor Bedard check at the end of the uh, show just because we're kind of. We're veering towards that territory. Did you catch how everybody's winning? Yes, I did. Like, or not? Or, or winning or gaining, we, gaining points anyway? We, like we love Arizona close. going on a bit of a hot streak. Very much back in play. Very much back in that race. A, t- a top five pick is not out of the question, even without lottery odds. Oh, very much so. Yep. Yep. Um, but okay. So, so you? I mean, where do you exactly want to start? Uh, with well, this whole okay. conversation, do you want to go like? Do you want me to start with how we got here, or or go more into the statement? Because we can go either direction. Let's here. start with how we got here. Okay, because you know I got asked that question when I was on the radio on Friday after, in the aftermath of the news, and really, you know, you you mentioned it right off the top here. We kind of glossed over last week the town hall portion of the week. You know, we talked a lot about the deadline. We talked a lot about the uh, we or not even a lot. We really didn't even touch that much on the Ranger game, but we did a little bit more than the town hall. And the thing about the town hall that's not that's interesting, but the thing about events like that are while it provides an opportunity for fans to go out and potentially have their voices heard, it's you know it, it, it's really rare, I think, for an organization to actually take any stock in that and make such quick action out of it. Right. Like, look, you can go and boo the guy all you want to, and you can complain about him as everybody has been for 18 months and and beyond, you know, and all that type of stuff. It doesn't mean anything's real. Like it doesn't always seem to influence these things. It, It it's, it's actually pretty seldom that fan reaction really is the final straw that actually breaks the camel's back and says, okay, you know what? This is what's going to make us change directions here and change who's running this and all of that type of stuff. So that's, I, I kind of explained it as this is a buildup. This was, let's just do the five or the five, six days that we're talking about Monday. John Tortorella hits you with the, this is a process. It's going to take time again. Right. And then Tuesday, Chuck Fletcher comes out. Tells you we're selling, but also tells you 
We're not looking to take shortcuts. We're all on the same page when they weren't all year. Um, we're the fifth most improved team in points percentage or whatever the hell he tried to pass off as the improvement marker, which riles everybody up. And it's like, you're not seeing the forest through the trees kind of in that sense. You're, you're trying to pull these little positives that make you look better, but you're still missing the point of what you need to be saying as a general manager of a team for where you are. Right. And the more that you keep saying these things, the more that just angers everybody. Right. We, it, we're not a team scrounging for points. We're not. Right. And, and here's the thing. Okay. So you're, you're improved, whatever your percentage is. And, Sure. Are they, you know what? Are they a top 10 in the league improved in points percentage this year? Yeah, they are. Do you know why? Because you know how easy it is to go up when you didn't when you have garbage a, last when, year. When the bar was set so low. Yeah. Like, Wait. sure, you're most improved because you know what? I'm sorry. You what? Is a team like Vegas going that much higher in points percentage when they had a good team last year and a good team this year? How high can you go? Right. That's fair. So, so all right. That's Tuesday. Wednesday is the Ranger game, which we documented last week. I, we don't really need to revisit everything with that, but but I did ask a question last week that I'll re rehash on this portion of the show, which was, if you're sitting in the management box, especially if you're the advisory group who played for the team, who bled for the team, uh, you know, when, when they did play, and, like, if you're okay with that and the way that your building looks in... And actually, I kind of took it a step further when I was on the radio on Friday because I even, you know, to go off of what we said last week, isn't isn't that game a perfect scenario of what should like of setting up what should be? It's Flyers Rangers national television March first playoff push time. Oh yeah, trade, that trade deadlines around the corner, and at that time, look, the Rangers are loading up, and if the Flyers are in a playoff position, you know, at the same time, they'd be loading up too. Oh and, yeah, especially this free agency off and season, and, and it's a rivalry, oh, yeah. and the building's gonna be full, and. Oh wait, it's full of Ranger fans in Philadelphia. That that and that's where let's the, that's, let's go Rangers chant ninety seconds into the game. That's where it goes. That's where the picture goes off. You know, goes yep. off the rails and goes out of the ordinary. Everything else about the scenario should be great. Flyers Rangers in March at the trade deadline with with a team loading up on national television. Like it should be a it should be a must watch game. It should you know what it like it should be the game that, the other game that we talked about last week that I ended up watching, which was, hey, when Boston and the Rangers got together over the weekend, it's like, yeah, got to sit down and watch that, that one because, good. because we're looking at playoff matchups now. That's what Flyers Rangers in March should be about. And it and it totally wasn't in this case. And that really, you know, I think that that was eye opening. That Fly, Flyers Penguins on Saturday. Same it, it thing. Sure. There's no ju- right. There's no juice to that today. No, absolutely none. I, the, I read a headline that was hopes to revive the rivalry, and it's like, well, yeah, because it's it's just been absolutely toast for the last couple right. of years. But um, he, so anyway, I yeah. think that I think Wednesday was eye opening. That was the start, that was the start of the eyes kind of being opened. Thursday, the thing with Thursday was nothing happened in the organization. But I know that a lot of people, I did a spot on Thursday, the other stations in the city were talking about it. It was like a breaking point. Like, that's why I say eye-opening, because I'm sh- look, I'm sure for something like this to happen a week from the trade deadline on Friday of that week that we're talking about, that it had to open eyes within the organization, too. Because that, if, it, it, if it doesn't, you don't do this. Simple right. as that. But I think that people who don't spend a lot of time, especially, I mean, by that point, what are we talking? Game that you said three more this week. So game 63 of an 82 game season where for the most part, most people have been able to, when you're four for four in a radio station and you're able to ignore the Flyers because they're not good and everybody useless and everybody else in the city has made a run. So you're able to ignore them. And that's what you're going to talk about, about because the Rangers took over your building. Then it's eye opening. It got your attention. It did. It, if nothing else, it accomplished what I think everybody was really hoping for, which was which was starting to provide a voice for the fans to get even more frustrated than they were. It's one thing, and you know, I've wondered not wondered this, but I've kind of felt this all along. 
in today's day and age, you have technology now that you didn't have in the 90s or whatever it was where, you know what, you get instant feedback on stuff. They tweet out something and everybody who everybody starts sending their hashtag fire Fletcher tweets and their sell the team tweets and all that type of stuff. You're getting instant feedback. And listen, you can you can you can choose to totally ignore it and go your own way because it's it's just, you know, oh, it's Twitter and it's social media and, it's and there's kids. Right. right and, and it's it's not sometimes it's not as real as it it is as it is but there's an element of realness to social media where it's like this is real people this could be your audience and that's when i think when the town hall comes into it too and you combine the two the town hall with the reactions that you get on a regular basis online now it gets really real because now real people are showing up to voice their displeasure to you right well and we do have to acknowledge just talking about kind of the online presence we do have to acknowledge the fact that Hockey is the smallest of the four sports in the in the U.S. Sure, like by by far, and you just don't have the reach that a basket that an NBA star does, or that even your average NFL player does. Sure, and when you do have a vocal group from your fan base, you have to give them some amount of attention because you don't have an you know. You don't have well, this big old population to choose from. You kind of got to pay sure. a little bit of attention. I'm not saying well, you listen I, to Twitter. No, but I, I also kind of lump that in with, you know what, a te- as a team by yourself, you know, just, just as the organization by itself, you don't focus on fourth out of four or what the other teams necessarily are doing. You got to run your own team. You've got your own fans. Right. You got your own season ticket right. holders. That's what you need to focus on. You, you know, there's people out there who don't care about the other sports in the city and go to the Flyers on a nightly basis, right? Like, it's, it's you know, it, 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 it's the way, you know, it, you choose whatever you choose to want it's, to enjoy. That's ba- basically where I'm at. So. Right. And I'm a little different, I, you know, and, and maybe right. look. We know you're think, a big Phillies guy. Well, and I, I think the reason it's a little different is because for me, watching the Flyers is a different experience than watching the Phillies. I watch the Phillies. I'm a fan. I watch the Flyers. I put, you know, I, I, the fan disappears, and I got to do my job. You know, right. there's a difference. And I yeah. look, and 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 I'm all about like that's why I'm all about Sundays during football season when the Eagles are on. I'm all about watching the Phillies. I've been, you know, one of the things I've loved is watching spring training games in the middle of the day right now because it's like okay, it's fun, and I get to just sit back and enjoy. It's not a game I'm writing. It's not a game that I'm analyzing with right. you know with a fine tooth comb here. It's I'm. You can turn your brain enjoying. off and enjoy it. Yep. Enjoy it as a fan. It's, sure. it's honestly, it's honestly why, like with baseball in particular, the last several years, I get to like I, I, I kind of eventually ended up at a game in April because the flyer season ends and I get to like it's like oh I'm gonna go and enjoy a game to enjoy a game and right. just be among the crowd, not you know work a game, but. But I think that like but you have to listen to your fans a little bit to it, not listen to them, but you have to acknowledge that you know where they stand, and you know you know what like it's funny right before because okay, let's get back on the timeline a bit because Thursday was kind of your first vocal springboard with the radio stations were doing a lot of stuff. There was a lot of conversation, especially from people who don't have it all the time, and then Friday was the deadline, and yep. we've. I'm not going to rehash everything from the deadline because we did it last week. We know what happened. And that just for a lot of fans, that was the end. That was the end of this. That was seriously, like seriously, you know, what more do you need to see to realize that this is not working? This guy is not capable of doing this job. Right. And I highlighted it on last week's show that Chuck Fletcher was not the biggest issue that the team had because of the fact that, listen, if Chuck Fletcher, you know, take Chuck Fletcher by himself and he's, his name is attached to every move that the team makes every single move, because when the releases come out, it's his name on it. So yes, can we blame him for everything? Sure we can, because his name is attached to it. And he's the guy on the front line who, when it comes time to address things from a management level, it comes out and says something. The state, like, let's say you brought up the statement that was made, you know, that they released when he gets let go, right? That's the first time Dave Scott's been in a statement all year because you never hear anything from him. So his represent, like, his name in in this is a little bit clean to an extent, not because he doesn't have responsibility, but he's not putting himself out there. He's not on those moves. It's Chuck Fletcher. So he takes the bullets on the front line 
but there's a whole host of people as you know, like, like I'm not doing, I'm not doing my job on this show or in writing or whatever. If I don't bring to bring to everyone's attention that these people are around him yep. and what goes into the front office a little bit. It's the so, bully's brain trust. It's the same guys that right. we've been talking about. We, you and I, us here on this show, we've been talking about this for 18 months, 12 really hard here. It's Bobby Clark. Mm -hmm. It's Paul Holmgren. It's Bill Barber. Mm -hmm. And it's Dean Lombardi. Those are the big four. And Chuck Fletcher, we have a term for Chuck Fletcher. Chuck Fletcher was the fall guy. Mm -hmm. And... I think Ron Hextall became the fall guy. Mm, and I'm throwing a caveat on that, but I'll let you finish. Right. Because I got obviously, to obviously Chuck Fletcher was a little bit more of a yes man, a little bit more of a yeah. puppet than right. Ron Hextall was. I will acknowledge that. But Ron Hextall became the fall guy for the team's failures. Chuck Fletcher has been used as a human meat shield here for that brain trust. And I think public sentiment has finally seen it for what it is. Um, I think the brain trust is exposed. I think a lot of fans, and listen, I'm not taking credit for it, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I have seen a lot of talk recently about Bobby Clark and about Paul Holmgren, about Bill Barber and about Dean Lombardi mm -hmm. that I, that I was not hearing three months ago. Sure. Well, and I, I got asked about kind of the brain tr – like that old guard and all that type of stuff a little bit. And one of the things that I brought up when it came to Hextall was let's rewind a little bit because obviously Hex – look, Hextall has been gone for near, you know, now nearly five years. But go back to – I guess it would have – it was close to 18 months ago because it was part of that whole mess of a year – like. The, the mess that 21 the short 22 year, 56 no, 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 season. No, 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 the one after oh, 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 21 oh. 22, where every time you turned around, there was some off ice story that I could be putting yep. something out about that you're like, what does this have to do? Like, not have to do with anything, but it's like, this is just another black eye on the organization. It's another thing that we, you know, I, we shouldn't have to talk about this, but we're going to, right? And I remember, like, go back to, go back to Bobby Clark's comments on the Cam and Strick podcast. Yep. Okay. And the way that he sounds when he talks about he, you know, he ignored our scouts. He, yeah, he went his own direction. He locked himself in a room. Does that not sound like a, a guy who feel who had his feathers ruffled Just by a bitter old man? But does that not sound like a guy who is part of an old guard who had their feathers ruffled because a guy absolutely. chose to go his own direction? It absolutely. Well, we all we all said that he should have picked Kale McCarr. Everyone else said that he should have picked Kale McCarr, and he went against us, and he picked Nolan Patrick, and he was wrong. Bob, Bob, A, you were saying Miro Heiskanen, you idiot. B, no, you weren't. Everyone was saying Nolan Patrick. Relax. <laughs> And even beside the point, it's it's not even the point of whether they picked one or the other. Because because listen, there's stuff with Hextall that aligns with Nolan Patrick that you can look at. Where yes, there's part of that story that's believable. Sure. You know, the, you know the Brandon Wheat King, which is where Hextall played. In, you know his junior career. So yeah, naturally he's you know he's gravitating towards the kid from that area as well, and all that. Okay, I'm not taking any of that away. But did you? But just to understand the emotion that that Bobby Clark had at that moment towards the idea that Hextall went off on his own. And we talked about the thing with the alumni and shutting them out a little bit and all that stuff like that. And, and kind of becoming that person as Hextall was toward the end. Obviously it ruffled feathers. And I think that as, as much as that, you know, look, as much as at the time, it felt like something needed to be done. And and listen, I'm not going to defend Ron Hextall's time here. It, it, that's that's beside the point. Let's just say there's a lot of things that you can't defend about Hextall's time here, whether you want to talk about how he ran everything from a general manager standpoint or how his draft picks have turned out, which which is really not on Hextall by himself as much as it is Hextall and the entire staff uh, who develop players who clearly didn't do it to the level that needed to be done to make the team what it should be today. I mean, if you had that many good players out of the draft, you should have a better team today, regardless of whether or not Chuck Fletcher's a good GM on, you know, on top of the fact, like, 
an average GM, if you get if you inherit a team that's drafted really well and developed really well, can get you somewhere. You know, absolutely. There's uh, obviously they didn't draft like the draft. Maybe they look. I think they drafted well because to me, you don't have that many people telling you that you drafted well if it wasn't true. I think they never developed well. That's what I think the real criticism is. But either way, because uh, I'm going off on a tangent on the Clark uh, on the Clark Hextall comment and all that stuff at this right. point. And I want to stick, to, you know, not stick to the timeline, but that's how we got here because the, the real, like, it seemed like, you know, and, and the only thing that seemed odd was kind of that they waited a week. I mean, the way it sounds, like, it sounds like you got to this point, if we're being real, you got to this point, like, on Sunday or Sunday or Monday, you know what I mean, of this week. I'm willing to bet a large sum of money that at some point between the trade deadline and when he was fired, Chuck Fletcher walked into a Delaware Valley Wawa and somebody said something snarky to him. Maybe. I don't know. 100%. That absolutely happened. (laughs) I have one in my head that I'm pretty sure it probably happened at. (laughs) Well, either way, um, whether that happened or not. (laughs) um, You know it did. Well, either way, it, it, it's, it just seemed like it was interesting. I mean, like, listen, if, if we're going to play the timing card here, of course, like, of course, was it about time? Absolutely. Something had to happen. But it was still, and I, I've t- I, I think this is the third, third week in a row maybe or fourth week in a row that I've used this line about proactive versus reactive. Yep. And we've had a, we had a long conversation about this last week, I think, because yeah. – because I brought up Washington and Detroit and realizing, you know what, we're probably not making the playoffs this year. So let's just, over, you know, take a good step back and look at the big picture and make a decision this year that's better for the long haul. And and that's why, like, it's why people like Steve Eiserman because Eiserman has enough vision to say, I'm not going to make that move. I'm not going to go desperate and try to patch something up with a desperation move and react to where we are and go, Oh, you know what though? If we could just get on a run and add this guy, maybe this puts us over the top and we'll get into the play. No, it's not about that. He's built. He's trying to build for the long haul. So hear me out here. They have a couple extra draft picks. Yeah. Carter Hart. Interesting. You bring up Carter Hart because I don't think his name's off the table this summer. It, it can't listen. It can't be. Danny nobody. Briere well, nobody acknowledged nobody a agrees. rebuild. Well, right. But Danny Briere acknowledged a rebuild, and Why? Carter Hart has what one year left at four, a hair under four. Yeah, th- the, it was, was it three seven nine or three nine seven nine. Oh, that's right. Yeah, um, there it is. Three nine seven nine. Number in it. That's yeah. right. Um, uh, but a hair under four, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> but he's got what one year left at four, and then he's under team control, or is it two years left? Uh, no, no, no. It's it's he's got one year after this one, year because okay. they can because they can sign the extension this summer if they want to. Daniel, Mr. Briere, sir, get a haul for Carter Hart, please, please. Here's two first round picks and a top tier prospect. All right, here, hang on here though, because here's the thing. The Minimum. Diff- no, no, this is the difference between, and I've seen a lot of this and I agree with it. So, you know, I've seen many people say this and I agree with it wholeheartedly. Okay. The difference between trading Carter Hart and not trading Carter Hart is quite simply being as upfront with him as possible about are you in this what, for the long haul or what are the next you 10 not? years, what the next five to 10 years looks well, like? Well, right. Like, yeah. if you're okay with the way the next five years go and coming out on the other side of it, and, and, and which certainly at his age and experience level, because, and I think the experience level is really the key factor because he debuted at 20. Right. So to debut He's at 20, right, but to debut at 20 in this, you know, what was, what, it, what would it have been? It was January of 2019 by that point, right? So to debut at, at 20 in the, in January of 2019 and now be past January of 2023, four years later, next year is going to be the same. Yep. So that's five years into his playing career. As you inch closer to the 10th year of your playing career. And as a goalie, you know, you're escaping the prime. Yep. Is this how you want to spend your prime? Yes it's, or no. It feels, and, ver- it feels very similar to the conversation that the Anaheim ducks probably had with John Gibson. 
Potentially. Now, when they, when they signed him to that long-term extension. Hey, listen, you're going to be here for a long time. We're heading down. We're probably going to suck for at least the first three or four of those years. Are you cool with that? And Gibson said, yeah. And if and, Carter Hart's willing to say, yeah, right. then you'll have him on a decent value on the back half of the deal. And you'll I'd hopefully say so. get a, a good couple of years out of him. But that's, but the, but that's the, if he's not, right. and quite frankly, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but I feel the vibe I get from the team is that he's he's liked. They like you know they don't dislike him, but he's not in tight. He's not in the gang because the guy just wants to win. I think right. more than anything, and I th- I think the last several years have been particularly hard on him and for for a ver- and for a variety of reasons, not just the losing of it. I think right. it's I think it, I think the injuries have hurt him in in that sense because of um like not being able to finish out your season so you don't finish up the way you want to it, it, it it's very out with a whimper kind of stuff because right. like you, you he would be out of he'd be out for the rest of the year with what 15 games left or something like that and it's like okay and everybody would agree the best thing to do is shut him down but right. at the same time how do you feel as a player if it's always well the best thing is you hurt yourself you tweak to this thing Best idea, best idea is to shut you down so you're good for next year. And it's like, the guy just, you know, like, just think about when we saw him at his best. We saw him at his best in a playoff series against Carey Price and the Montreal Canadiens. He outdueled Carey Price, so Incredible. he can outduel. He can outduel a, go- a really good, an elite goaltender. Yeah, he absolutely. has the ability to do it. So, I think you know the the key is putting him around a team that can also get him further into the playoffs than that. And well, and if you're Carter Hart, what would you rather do play right. with, you know, but a the, team full of this or go? Sure. Well, well, and think about it. Would you rather have the churn of the third GM during your short tenure with the organization? For real. Yeah. Or would you rather go play for a guy? And again, I'm just throwing out Detroit just as a hypothetical. Sure. I think it's fun and makes a lot of sense. Um, it could. Go to a guy named Steve Eisenman who has done absolutely nothing but win. For real. And build, and build ridiculous teams. And Detroit is probably contending a year before they, like, expected to be. They're just getting better. That that is, engine is just getting into high gear. It's why it was so interesting to watch them back off because they were in the race. And yet Eisenman had enough. That's what I'm calling. This is why I'm saying this. Proactive. It's proactive to have the foresight to know it's better to hold off instead of worrying. Like, like, what would you rather do at this point in your franchise's run to getting back into the playoffs? Make the playoffs as an eight and get or as a get second blown winner. out by the Bruins, right? Get swept by the Bruins in the first round. Well, which ironically enough, by the way, they they split they, a weekend. I know home and home with them and so scored maybe, two quick goals on them on Saturday. Right. Sure. But, anyway. But okay, but still, would you rather get knocked out in four or five, or you know whatever, or would you rather have a real shot at it? And, and that's the, how Steve Eiserman operates. And the thing that convinces me that Steve Eiserman's a good GM is because Dylan Larkin was frustrated coming into this season. He was vocally frustrated and talking and about testing the market. And during the trade deadline got season, him to commit. he inked them to eight years. Yep, got that, him mean, to that means he sold them, and you sold the captain on your plan. Smooth sailing. And I'm going to tell you what. The right Iser now, plan is in full effect. And I'm going to tell you what. The um, the the AAV on that deal it's is gonna going to look good down the stretch. It absolutely will. Yep. So, But I swear to God, if he grows out the Brendan Shanahan goatee one more time, <laughs> I'm going to drive to Detroit and smack him. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> but Dylan, it's a bad look, my dude. <laughs> Holy right. smokes. Back to the Flyers. Yes. So, but that's, but this, uh, again, the proactive, and the thing is, is that making this decision is too reactive. It's very, like, it's so reactive that it, because it has everything to do with the fan reaction. Like, you're reacting to the, like, you got, you realize it got to a breaking point with the fans where you're like, we can't just sit and do nothing. Like, like, quite legitimately, there's no difference. There is zero difference between firing Chuck Fletcher on Friday and waiting until the end, the day after the season ends, which is, I think, a span of five weeks at this point, right? Something like that. Something there's, like that. There's I'm, no I'm, difference I'm, between the five or six weeks in terms of what's going to be done otherwise, other than satisfying the fact that your fans are furious. Yep. That's the only difference. And 
the thing is, and I hope you know, I hope that people, whether you read whether you read me or whether you're reading some of my colleagues, are reading what we're saying because I think a lot of us stuck to the message of, yeah, this is the first step, but it has to be the first. It can't yeah. be. You know, it can't be, okay, he's gone, so let's start over. And let's and... let the same group of guys pick his replacement. Right. L- right. Like, if Bob, if Bob Clark and Bill Barber have say in who the new GM is, what is the point? Right. It, like, it's, gr- you know, it's great that this was an admission that things are not working. That, that That's great. You know, y- y- you got the point. You got the message. This wasn't working. Make a change. Okay. You made a change, but it can't be your only one. And it's funny. I remember, so the day that everything, so on Friday when everything really went down, um, so, the, and, and listen, and listen I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give credit to everybody who had anything on it. I know that Anthony DeMarco, the fourth period, was really on top of it with like kind of an overnighter. It was, wow. like, one, it was like 1 a.m. and he had like tomorrow could, like there's stuff brewing. Wow, good but, for him. Yeah, for real. That's I woke. Good That's a good yeah, source it, it, right there. Oh, and, and he's good at and he's really good at this type of stuff. So I I want to give full credit there, and and we know the other like we know the others that are typically really plugged in. Like you know, Anthony San Filippo has a lot of stuff on that type of stuff. Frank and, Saravalli knows people in the front office. Let's well, be and here's and here's the thing. So I, I again I want to give credit to three more people okay. before we move on to like kind of dissecting it. So I saw, when I woke up on Friday morning, I saw this. Tw- I saw a tweet that is actually time stamped about seven a.m. on Friday. So now we're little over a little over two hours away from when the official announcement comes out, right? That uh, and Jeff Merrick, um, thirty two thoughts pod, all that type of stuff with Elliot Friedman, the Jeff Merrick show, <laughs> puts puts out things are definitely moving in Philadelphia. Not a hundred percent sure where it's heading, but today could be a big day for the Flyers. And I retweeted that and then tweeted out after, I, like once I saw it. Let's see how, and I put in quotes, big a day it really is, because there's a difference between truly significant change and just moving the furniture around. Which, let's be real. Today or on Friday, and and to this point today, they moved the furniture around to this point. Oh yeah, because, yeah. Let's let's and, be and, totally and, clear. Firing the general manager is not enough. Like Chuck, well, Fletch, Chuck Fletcher, one down. Oh yeah. Oh, oh More yeah, to yeah. go. More well, to sure. go. Well, and here's the thing, because I say there's a big difference, but there's all okay. Maybe Friday wasn't moving the furniture around. It's it's almost more of. You took one piece of furniture, put it on the curb, and in addition, quite possibly put a for sale sign up in the yard. Right. Which is to say, this is where we're trying to go, and now you got to follow through with the rest of this. And then shortly like, thereafter, we stick the yard sale sign in the front lawn. <laughs> Everybody can go. Well, I, I'm calling it. A for, uh, that's why I said for sale sign. I mean, you're you're trying like you're pretend like not necessarily selling the team. You get but like, no. But overhaul, although, no, although but overhaul, Comcast, listen, if you want to. But, but overhauling the um the front office, right? Um, the initial report and the statement, the breaking news story on this is the change, like the specific change, like like Anthony Demarco had something's brewing like the chain there's there's potential for changes and Marek had potential for changes could be a big day but nobody had the specific the first right. people nobody had who, chuck fletcher's fired the first two people who had chuck fletcher's being relieved of his duties on friday were gianna Hahn and olivia reiner of the inquirer so that okay. i want that's why i want to pass credit where everything goes like anthony had the initial you know, the night before, Marek said big day possibly coming. I, you know, which I questioned a little bit because I'm like question in terms of we'll see what the definition of big is at the end of the day. Fair. And and then it was. I mean, we're talking two three minutes after I had asked. You know, what does big mean or what well, is big going to mean? And that's when that's when Gianna and Olivia had the report out about Fletcher being the one who was being let go well, and Briere wonder... and Briere taking over. I wonder if there was a conversation with Dave Scott and Comcast. Mm -hmm. If there was a conversation about just doing it all and just cleaning house and 
Dave Scott's gone and Bobby Clark's gone and Bill Barber's gone and Paul Holmgren's gone and Dean Lombardi's gone and here we are. Danny Briere is it's Danny Briere and somebody from Comcast. Here we go. <laughs> well, okay. Well, so let's get into a lot of this here. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's break down this because first of all, once once we had like hints of the statement and and the official statement and all that type of stuff, I I I immediately in reacting to just the Fletcher news at face value tweeted two things to note on the decision the timing and the verbiage the timing one week after the trade deadline is baffling this feels reactionary to the vitriol that came after last week especially in especially in allowing Fletcher to oversee the deadline that said naming Briere as and I, again interim GM and noting that they be, they quote begin to chart a new path forward under a new leadership structure for hockey operations indicates that more may be coming which is necessary so i thought that all of that language was really interesting we're changing the structure we're putting you know we're not just going straight to danny briere's gm that's the end of that conversation he's still gonna in you know interim is interim and and what look we'll get into whether and like what his status is and like the likelihood that he becomes the gm going forward but but putting the interim tag on him at this stage of the season kind of feeling like you knew where you were going to go at the end of the season anyway is still interesting. Um, so I'm continuing to go through, and again, and again, like Anthony Sanfilippo had tweeted out something about being told that even bigger changes coming at the season's end. So like like pretty much everybody kind of got on the same, or like kind of got through, through in, more information, kind of piecing together stuff. That Chuck Fletcher was going to be the only casualty on Friday. And anything else that's going to come is more of a season end kind of thing. It's going to be something they hide in the day after. You know, people are just going to be quietly released. Right. And, and here's the thing. Well, and Sam Filippo in his tweet put even bigger change coming at the at season's end as the franchise looks to fill, quote, several roles. This could well mean a retirement of key individuals at the top, which is, right. again, interesting information there because th we know who we're talking about when we say that it's Dave Scott. Well, it's Dave Scott, but I think it, again, it's the advisors. I think that yeah. that's an, it's important to talk about that group and, and, and you know what, like, and, and again, so, uh, so now the official team statement comes out the whole thing. And again, I noted another interesting part of the verbiage, which we can get into right now, which is that they had said they're going to separate the general manager and president of hockey operations roles. And I think that that's important because it's a great decision. I think it's necessary because, you know, look, Danny Briere could be, you know, maybe Danny Briere is a great GM. Maybe he, you know, maybe he doesn't turn out to be, but that remains to be seen. You know, he, he's 48 hours into the job at this point right. as it, with an, with an interim label. So he's not doing sure. much, but, and not to, a ton yeah. of track record for the record professionally. He ran the main Mariners for a couple of years. Sure. And uh, like we talked about, he has been the special assistant to Chuck Fletcher for the last year. Well, or and, and, and let's uh, let's be real about the main Mariners thing for a second, too. He really learned a business aspect of the whole thing first and then jumped into hockey ops. Right. So he almost like and that's what I've said about him. He kind of worked backwards because a lot of people don't know the business side as much when you're in hockey ops. You just kind of go through, okay, what's the how do you how do you ascend in the hockey operations world? You're usually a scout, then maybe player personnel, and then you know, and then maybe you know, assistant and then GM. And he basically ran an entire franchise top to bottom in the minor leagues for several years, and yeah. then the fly and, and and basically. And I, I remember saying this last year when the uh, Montreal job was up for grabs, Montreal was interested. And then all of a sudden it was like the Flyers were like, yeah, okay. So he didn't get that job and we better put some other label on him before he gets another offer. Yep. Or, or before he gets an offer. Cause he wasn't really formally offered the Montreal job. He was a finalist, right. but still they, they got very protective at that point where it's like, okay, there's other teams out there that may be interested in him. We better give we him gotta, a We got to lock him up. Right. Now. We better give him a label. And they slapped that label on him pretty quickly. And they, after and they said you're next, basically. Right. right. Yep. So okay. So there's no more changes and all this stuff like that. And and, and that that's you know. And I wrote, the, that's why I wrote. What's up? The fly the flyers called dibs on Danny Briere. Pretty much. That's essentially what they did. Um, so they make no other changes yeah. on Friday. And basically, you know, like I said, the message kind of has to be: this is the first step. Chuck Fletcher was obviously a part of the problem. It's the but it's the first step of this because. We now need to see 
not even to see. We already feel like we know what a problem, like we know what a problem everybody else kind of the influence of everybody else the or the lack thereof, really, because there's an element of this where we always like, you know, one of the things that I turn around, I described when it came to the advisory group and Dave Scott was if, you know, if you never see Dave Scott, hear from Dave Scott, none of that. Right. Then who are his eyes and ears when the games are going on and when you're trying to evaluate the team? Well, it's the people who get into his ear who are part the of the alumni. advisory group. It's the advisory group. It's it, you know, probably you know probably at the top of that list is really more Bill Barber who has a lot to, who is like his assistant. But then you know that the input of Clark and Holmgren is part of that goes hand in hand. So that you know that's why and that's really why for me there's no there's no in between here. There's not an easy way to look at this and go like there's no way to look at this and feel like you can be comfortable with. Well, if Clark's not part of this anymore, then I'll be okay with it. Like, I don't think there's an in-between here. You either get rid of the whole thing and clean house completely at that level. The entire or, or, front or, office needs a colonic. Right. Or you, or you just end up in the same position that you've constantly been in. Yep. And, you know, I know that there's going to be a lot made of the names that are floated out there about what – like, like, and let's talk about Danny Briere for a second in this because Briere – a seems like he's in it for the long haul. I would say at I mean at this point I he's definitively the favorite to retain the GM job when the season's over when you know I'm not saying they're not going to go through a little bit of a process but he's all he's the favorite. I think it's pretty obvious. I mean like 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 I said when he one was in the, the running Yeah. Yeah, no I hear you with one of the jobs I, I, really, I could see them giving him president of hockey ops. See I think I th- I'm not saying I couldn't see it. I just think he's better equipped for GM at this point. I would lean. I agree. I would lean more towards making him the GM. But like, if they got somebody who is a better suited as a GM, I could easily see them sliding him up to hockey ops. There's, but I sure there's potential for yeah. it. But you know the way that I kind of consider it because there was a lot of discussion, probably back as recently as November, December ish, that I can remember that it was a distinct possibility if things got to a breaking point with Chuck Fletcher a little bit, that the response by everybody would be, because we've heard this all before, that you know Chuck's a nice guy and they trust him and all this stuff, that the, that the idea of making a change would be just drop the GM part from Chuck Fletcher's title. He's still president of hockey operations. Briere, Hires, takes, over. Yeah, no, right. Briere takes over as GM. And, and I always would argue with that, okay, there are – there are other teams in, in sports and other teams in the city in particular that have this dynamic of someone's the president of operations, whatever sport you are, and someone's the general manager. And every time somebody makes a move, I, the Phillies are the prime example because when the Phillies get Bryce Harper, when the Phillies bring – well, and this was actually Bryce Harper was before this part, but when the Phillies get Trey Turner this offseason – Sam Fold's the GM of the team, but did Sam Fold bring him in or did Dave Dombrowski, the president of baseball operations, bring him in? Everybody puts the attention on Dombrowski. Well, then right. if the Flyers did anything in that dynamic, then Chuck Fletcher's still the guy who's overseeing it all. Well, and how does Danny Briere make a decision on his own with well, well, you know, the guy the who point. just then had it's... this job hanging up? I am sick. I am so glad they didn't do this because I am sick of guys being Flyers GM and then being president of hockey Promoted. ops. Right. I hate kicked upstairs because kicked upstairs is how we got this nonsense. Which is that's one of the, why Paul Holmgren is still floating around. That's why Bobby Clark's still sure, floating but that's, around. But that's one of the biggest things from Friday is that it was exactly what it was. You're just out. There's no promotion. You know, there's no promotion for not doing your job. Go well play it's, golf. It's, it's leave. You're just flat out gone. Yep. Okay, that's big, and that's why I said that's that's why it was necessary. Um, so I I think Briere is you know listen I I'm not gonna say he's it's it's impossible for him to get the president of hockey ops job. I think he's better suited for GM because then because then he gets somebody who becomes that you know that that, that Dombrowski type that that guy yeah. who you sit there and you say okay I associate a lot of the moves with the more experienced guy who is going to do whatever you know what I mean right. and and I get you know so but I got I got this sense that he was being groomed to be a general manager. And when, again, when he got into the running for the Montreal job, it just seems like there's this sense that if they weren't able to retain him as part of this front office, that it would, there would be a sense of great loss if he wasn't the guy that was sitting there waiting in the wings for whenever the next move was. So that's why I think it's him. Um, I, 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 I do want to mention, I do want to mention, by the way, 
it was really nice seeing the look on his face, the, the little smile, the pride in his voice that he's the Flyers general manager. Like, oh, he feels, yeah, he feels it. You can tell it, it means a lot to him. Like, it does. The, the phrase be a flyer, like, he, he's that. Well, I, you know what? I, I and I, I'm looking through the, the, the tweets that I have quoting him from today, and one of them that stands out, it's something that'll stay with me a long time the emotion of having this title. He's, he's definitely feeling He's and, all in, dude. And, and this is the thing like, there's a lot of people who go crazy over like that he was surprised, like, because he says he was surprised by like Friday. And I was like, surprised in the sense that, like, not surprised, I guess, that change can happen because that's the business of hockey. And the right. business of sports. I think he's like, I think like a lot of us, the timing is a little surprising. Don't you think? Like it's a week after the trade deadline. There's nothing left to do. Danny Briere can't do anything for the next, you know, like realistically, he can't well, do anything significant for the next five weeks. It's evaluation. That's what he's doing for I, the rest of the season. If I kind of think that's right. I kind of think that's why you do it now. Cause you give him the rest of the season. Well, Sure. But I, I he think doesn't there was really a, have to worry about, you know, the next big obstacle is the draft, and you have a long time and a draft lottery before then. But I think that 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 a big part of that is that if look, if there wasn't such a big fan response to the Ranger game and the trade deadline and all of the little pieces that we've continued to put together, then it probably would have just been the same dynamic for the rest of the season. Like that was when it was lining up to be okay. Oh yeah. The, that's the next we, time we're going to talk about you. I mean, it, when we were inside of two weeks until the trade deadline or, well, probably even a little little longer than that even. And it was like, well, they're not going to make the change now because what are you going to do? Fire him two weeks out from the deadline? He's the guy been, making calls. We've been talking about the fact that Chuck Fletcher should be fired for a very long time. But it's been pretty clear over the last two months or so mm -hmm. that he every day he spent here, he was going to be a lame duck GM. And that's why I talked earlier about at a certain point it's a mercy firing. Like right. just let him just let him start his life. So I want I want to talk about two things as we move forward on this. And number yeah. one, you know, no, one's going to talk about some of what Briere said over the course of the whole thing. But really, you know, the quote that needs to be heard and put on every you know put it all over any stationery that they have in the Flyers' offices. Put it on the billboards. Put it on the marketing materials. Put it on everything because. The statement that Dave Scott put out on Friday as part of the information about Chuck Fletcher being let go said a multi-year process, which is very telling. It's finally an admission of where it seems like it's going to go. And Briere got asked about this, about do you see it as a multi-year process? And his answer was, that's my belief. It needs to be done the right way. I think it's what's needed and it's what's important moving forward, not rushing into things. There's no doubt it, it, that this is not a quick fix in my mind. Thank and you, Danny. That's the right answer. Yep. It's it's the right answer if you, you stick to it. And, and he doubles down it. So I'm just going to read off a bunch of stuff here because these are note, a lot of these are notes that I have from Briere's availability because it's interesting pieces that we have to hear about kind of what's still lingering about what this team could do, what the franchise could do in the weeks and months ahead. One of the first things I'm going to bring up is that it was really interesting to hear Briere bring up an, a second name when talking about ownership representation. This, this is a story that kind of flew under the radar a little bit because the impression was it wasn't going to mean much. Comcast Spectacor, about a month ago, hired a new CEO, Dan Hilferty. And the concept was... He wasn't going to have much to do with the Flyers themselves. He, th like, and, and listen, if you're just getting this, this CEO job in February, well, how much are you going to do before the season's over? I mean, we're talking it was two months out from when the season was over. How much, like, if look, you can learn a lot in two months, but if you're not going to have a ton of hands-on involvement with the hockey team that's part of the Comcast whole entity, Portfolio. If you will, right, right? Then I don't know that you're going to make a bunch of big changes. But Briere brings up and says. Well, we got to talk, you know, there's a lot of things to talk about with Dave and Dan. Well, okay, so now you're telling, basically you're telling us he is involved. And to what extent? And what does this mean for Dave Scott? Because this is very much Dan Hilferty's responsibility now as much as it is Dave Scott's. And Hilferty was just brought on, so it's not, you know, the past is not a reflection on him. Right. But if there's a dedication to fixing the past... This guy could almost be a savior of sorts if he takes the action. Like, like if he's going to come in here and the idea is 
Dave Scott may be inching towards retirement. We're going to push a little bit more for that. Yeah. And hey, the advisors that are here, I respect you. And Briere said that and you know all that type of stuff. But we may need to push you in a different direction too. If you're going to come in and take that level of action as the like kind of as the new ownership representation, then you may become a savior if this goes the right direction. Like it, it almost kind of like look. Sell the team stuff is uh, as much as people want them to, and I understand where it comes from. That's Hiring a new CEO is essentially selling the team. You're, you're getting a new no, voice in well, there to completely reset the. But it's, the, but it's the hard. It, it like, yeah. like, and when I say it's hard, what I mean is, you don't see that stuff every day. Coaches get fired on a regular basis. Right. General managers get fired, and you can change the front office construction around. You know, with these senior advisors and things like that. One of the things I actually said, and I'm trying to remember where I, I think I said it on the station. Do you, and I'm sure you probably do realize it because of the fact that we've had enough conversations about the senior advisor group, but not even the original six teams have as many senior advisors as the Flyers do. I mean, the Flyers list of senior advisors is four deep, and most teams have one. Do you remember the Ken Holland Edmonton Oilers? Vaguely. When they had three or four alumni floating around, Paul Coffey had a job not really doing a whole lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kevin Lowe had a job Lowe kind probably of floating did. around not doing a whole lot. Sound familiar? A little bit. I mean, and they've – look, they've really overhauled that department too. Exactly. And it looks like they have finally assembled – it maybe not a top tier roster. There's still some work there's, to be done. They could use another defenseman. They could use a little bit of goaltending yeah. help. But generally speaking, that roster is in a much, much, much better spot than it was three years sure. ago. And the, if anything remotely considering that, you know, remotely resembling that happens here, I'll consider it a success. Sure. In terms of cleaning it out, I mean, just in well, terms right. of and, uh, getting that many well, guys out of like, that office. You can you can live in the past to a certain extent. Like, look, there's, and this is why, I, like, one of the things I've talked or not talked about, one of the things I've thought about a lot is there's going to be a lot of discussion. And listen, you can perceive the names that are going to be out there however you want to perceive them. If there, if a former Flyers name comes up and you're just fed up with the idea that anybody who has a pre, like, you can be fed up that Danny Briere is going to probably be the general manager of the team moving forward and is the interim now because, well, he played. Uh, it's so more of the same. It's right. the same old thing. Look, this happens everywhere. How many former players are out there that go to do this or that or whatever? Like Hockey is every, by far the biggest nepotism sport. It's not even that it's, that's not even that it's nepotism as much because nepotism would be more of a like, hey, I help my kid out to get in that's there fair. or whatever. Like this is more of just like, again, it's that networking kind of thing. Like in general, it's a giant fraternity. If you yep. played the game at the NHL level, you're in the fraternity for life. And you may have an opportunity to get, to get a job down the line. And guess what? Get a job in a variety of ways. Because you could get a job as an ex-player in management, coaching, broadcasting. It's everywhere. They're all over the place. It's part of – it's just part of the fabric of the sport. And right. it always has been and it always will be. So just because a guy is connected to the Flyers in the past in some way doesn't mean he's built the Flyer way. There's a difference. Right. If you've been, look, if you've been hanging around for the last, like, and, and this is why Bri for Briere, I understand a little bit of the concern. If you've been hanging around with that group, you're a little concerned about that. And I can understand that. But if we're talking about a guy who's a former flyer who has had nothing to do with the team for the last however many years, then they don't have the influence of those guys. I mean, I'm sure they have a little bit of it because they played here and they know them, but they don't have a ton. I trust Danny Briere to do his best to okay Boomer the bullies just as much as possible. <laughs> the thing about Briere is the thing about Briere is this, okay? If Danny Briere, like, what do the fly, like, what do the Flyers need the most when it comes to on ice? It's a pretty scoring. simple. Well, I was gonna say point. scoring is a fair answer. I mean, there's a, there's a variety of one word answers you could give, and they would all be correct. Okay. Scoring is a good one. Speed is a good one. Skill, skill. is a good one. Skill is a good one. Talent is Ability, a good one. Right. You know what I mean? And here's the thing. They really like Briere is almost one of the last, you know, look, I'm not sure. And Claude Giroux obviously was a big talent. Don't get me wrong. But Briere is really one of the last pure goal scorer. Like Giroux wasn't a pure goal scorer. He was a playmaker. 
Danny Briere was a freaking sniper. But Danny Briere could go out there, and if you, if if, nope. if he got hot enough and was on his game consistently, he had he had forty potential. Yep, even if he was two feet off sides. And oh well, and then put him in the playoffs oh, and, and watch it go to a whole new level. Thirty points in the twenty ten playoff run, just which oh. no, which is no, but sometimes like listen, if you, all the only thing that should matter about anybody who gets a job in the NHL today is do you understand the game today? If you live and die by the nineteen seventies way, then you're doing it wrong. But yep. if you can be forward thinking enough to go, listen, I've seen the way the game is going. And like something that I think matters from Briere's standpoint that he brought up, and I'm trying to see if I have it any further. No, I didn't actually write it down in the notes yet, but um was yeah, he brought up like when he got to Philly. Paul Holmgren was the general manager, and, and the year he got to Philly was an interesting one because he got here in an offseason where they had just finished last. And then the next year they were in the, the conference final because they overhauled the roster in a year. And it worked out in their favor and, and overhauled it to the point where conference finals that year, two years later, Stanley Cup final with yep. a lot of the same players and a lot of the same core. Yep. So, okay, he's taking – look, at that time – Paul Holmgren's his general manager. He's taking some of the stuff that Paul Holmgren's doing, especially in that one particular year. Hey, I'm building this thing back this way. We're going to just kind of overhaul gonna a lot. Of, well, no, right. We're going to overhaul a lot of parts of it to try to get back on track, and that's a lesson. But Danny Breer's last two years as a player were spent one year in Montreal and one year in Colorado, and he brings up. Well, I forgot I, he went to Colorado. And he brings up, well, when I was toward the tail end of my play career, I started to I paid more attention to what general managers do and, and what how teams are built. So I observed Mark Bergevin and I observed Joe Sackick. And I certainly love the sound of yeah, I paid attention to the guy who just won a Stanley Cup. Joe friggin' Zach. Yeah, Bergevin not so much, but Joe friggin' Sackick, yes, sir. No, nah, but Bergevin the thing that Bergevin did is got the team younger, which is part of the path. That's that I'll agree with. Like Bergevin's responsible for at least for, hey, like, hey, do you like the core that Montreal has with Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield? It's pretty solid. He helped he a had, lot of that. He That's had fair. foresight to draft players like that, at least. So That's you fair. got something. That's all that I – and sometimes that's all that matters. Like, a lot of – there's a lot of guys who we consider poor GMs that usually are poor in a, in a particular aspect. And if you're, if you're poor at the drafting part, then you don't even build the core that gets off the ground. If you're poor at the signing the free agent contracts and going big, and that's where it falls off the rails, not the, hey, I was able to build a core and we have a foundation, but we don't have the finish line, then you're poor at that and you at least make the playoffs every year and you make a, you know and your franchise is profitable and you have reasons to keep going for it. So you're going to keep talking about Kyle Dubas? Or? <laughs> I mean, Dubas is an interesting example. He falls into the same category. You know who falls into the same category too? Steve Eiserman from his time in Tampa. You have to go through the foundational aspect and get it there. And then and and that's the thing. What is you know, what do Eiserman and Sackick have in common? They knew how to do both. Yep. They knew how to get the foundation going, and then it was okay, now I have to go for it. I know exactly how I'm gonna approach and, and, going for it. And Joe Sackick tore the avalanche down. They were atrocious. They set some records for how bad they were. Sackick handled a lot of situations about as well as you could imagine, too. I think of the Duchesne situation. Like when you, even, you know, yeah, even in like, more recent like, times, like Nathan McKinnon screaming at Jared Bednar. <laughs> you remember that whole thing? Yeah. Well, you, you know what? You tend to forget about a lot of stuff like that when you win a Stanley I, Cup. I mean, that, you know, when they say healing, uh, winning heals everything. Yeah, it does. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, it does. But, but but I but but you got to be encouraged by a guy who is not just sitting here going, oh, you know, like I'm I'm taking at face value everything that Holmgren says and Clark says, and they were GM, so I pay attention to. No, no, no. Like I'm going off of these are guys I play for. Oh, we also, by the way, mentioned, and and this is a kind of a good time frame to mention it, like to meant for for this team. He mentioned in his time in Buffalo, okay. uh, Darcy Regeer was the general manager there at the time and built a team that got to the conference final in back to back years that was really on the rise, could have gotten to a cup final. A lot of people thought they had a shot. I mean, that, oh, yeah. In, in 06, they were close. They were really close. That Sabres team was nasty. Yes. So you've got some, inc like, it's, it's just interesting to listen to him talk about being kind of being a sponge for 
hey, you know what? I paid close attention to my general managers too, and I want to know, like, I want to know everything about that and all that type of stuff like that. So, okay, so you get past the top layer of the management, which is okay. If Hilferty's part of this group now, like with Dave Scott, and there's certainly the possibility that Dave Scott just ends up riding off into the sunset at this point with a re- with a potential quiet, he'll gracefully retire. Like, See ya. you know, sure. Now you still have the the influence of the senior advisors, and I think removing that matters both in running the organization and in the search for candidates. I think it's interesting that Briere didn't have a clear cut answer on that, which indicates it's a situation with moving parts today. Yep. You know, which is all it was ever going to be, but nothing is certain. The the last thing you should have wanted to hear was I respect them a lot. And yeah, I absolutely am going to lean on them. I can't wait to work with them. Right. He didn't say that. He said, I I respect them a lot, but it's really a decision to be made. Yep. Well, all right. That sounds like nothing. That is very encouraging. Yep. That's nothing certain there. Now, I do think it's interesting that Briere said he expects Brent Flair to return and remain in his assistant role. I'm fine. Uh, well, I'm see. I'm not so sure about that. Just because Brent Flair was so attached at the hip with Chuck Fletcher, that I think the optics are better if you let Briere go out and just well, strike either his Bri- own, well find well, his own team. Well, either Briere or whomever the GM is pick your own assistant moving forward. I want, you know, a name that came up because Breer has ties to Arizona as well. And two names that came up that I thought were really interesting. And I think it was mentioned on the, they do a 32 thoughts segment on hockey night in Canada. And this is when those names were brought up. Um, Ray Whitney and Shane Doan. Now I don't ever see Shane Doan leaving the Arizona coyotes and having a role outside of there. But Ray Whitney's an interesting one because First of all, a lot of people who hear Ray Whitney, I think, immediately think Ryan Whitney and, th- and go to Chicklets and all that type of oh, stuff. Oh, when I hear Ray Whitney, I think Carolina. Well, I hear Ray, nah. Ray Whitney, and I think goal scorer. I mean, the guy that's could fair. play. Oh, yeah. He was a really great player. And I think that's an interesting dynamic. I think that could be something that's interesting. Now, beyond and, – and listen, that doesn't even go into the guys who could be on, on a president's side because one of the names that was brought up, same segment, like – Let's be clear. Let's go off of the very first three that we heard uh, mentioned that were on uh, 32 Thoughts the day that Fletcher was fired. They brought up a few names that could have interest. And one of them is maybe as clear as day as it gets because it, it, in a way it makes a lot of sense. Like it, it, it's, it sounds typical. Let's just say that. It sounds typical. Is this, are you, is this the Eric Lindros one? Sure it is because it sounds yeah. typical. Now, man. Now, I, look, I, it seems like Lindros is far enough removed from that group because he's not really – he's not do around you know, them. Do you know the victory lap Eric Lindros would do if he sweeps <laughs> in as Bobby Clark's getting swept out? <laughs> Come on. Come on. That, that, that dynamic is not lost on me, I will you tell you. You cannot I, tell me that they're cool. They cannot be cool. No, but, they're, they're, but again, what did I say a little bit a little while ago? There's no in between for me. It's either all I agree. or nothing. And yep. and one guy who Lindros has said many times is responsible for patching up the overall relationship between the Flyers and Lindros is Paul, Paul Holmgren. Yep. And look, that's all well and good because I think, look, if, to be honest, it might be one of Holmgren's finest moves in the last however long to, to patch Probably up a relationship is. with a Hall of Fame player. That's great. I just don't like there's that thought in the back of my mind that goes. If Lindros gets a job, is he going to lean on Holmgren because Holmgren patched up the relationship? And I just don't even want to think about that possibility. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Um, but his name was brought up. Um, it for whatever re- you know, for whatever reason, I think there's. I think he's been linked to things in Philly before. Um, but Ed Olchek's name comes up. That's an interesting one to me. I don't. I don't really know how that would work. I. I, I tend to just think you know. It's kind of let's way. It's kind of like you know Pierre Maguire was working for teams too, you know, and it's kind of like going from you know, oh that, how's that going to work? The, you know, the guy who was on your television for how many years is going to get a job in a hockey operations department again? Right. I don't know how that's going to go. Um, but the other, the third name they brought up kind of intrigued me. And again, yes, it's a former flyer, but it's a guy who I think has also run the gauntlet of business jobs and hockey job, hockey ops jobs and learned that part of the game. And it's Chris Pronger. I thought that was an interesting one. Pronger's been around after retiring. Right. He worked in the league office for a couple of years, famously as the voice of the player safety videos. Um. <laughs> he, um, I think he also, when, um, when Peter Luco left, 
the Flyers and went, I think went to Florida, Pronger went with and okay. worked around him and kind of learned a lot about operating a team. And I, you know, if you, there was, there was a stretch of time. I don't know if he's doing it as much anymore, but his Twitter account was full of like understanding how, how contracts work right. and how a player thinks of his contract. He really knows a lot about that type of stuff, which is encouraging if you're going to put him into a role of hockey operations. So right. and, and so just on kind of the overhaul, by the way, the, the difference between Pronger and Briere and kind of your standard, well, why are we hiring flyers again? Is that they're not, they weren't flyers. They they both came here later in their careers as, you know, yeah. big money targets. And they didn't come through the system. They didn't play with for the Phantoms. They didn't, you know, stuff like that. Well, yes. And that, and like you said, Briere has spent time elsewhere. Chris Pronger has spent time elsewhere. Pronger played for what? I think like four, t- yeah, four teams? Right. Jesus. Because by the time his career ended, obviously his career ended real like well, his career ended as an Arizona Coyote, if right, you will, sure, for, formally, but it ended as a Flyer. But right, but to, uh, but, to but to win a cup in Anaheim and Bobby go to Clark, a Cup final in Edmonton and play for St. Louis all those years and 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 you know all that you know yes, Pronger's got a history. Bobby Bobby Clark was drafted in 1969, and other than a two year stint in the early 90s with the Minnesota Wild, has been with the Philadelphia Flyers consistently since then. Min- and that Min- is the problem. Uh, Florida. The Minnesota North Stars. I'm sorry. Oh, Minnesota North. Wait, what about? Fl- yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I thought Clark was in Florida at one point. Uh, did he play there? No, 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 no. He he had a job down there. He was one of their first. Are you? I, I think you're talking about Minnesota. I don't. I'm not sure about that. I'm looking that up right now because I thought he was. No, he. Okay, so yes, he did have a short two year stint in. Oh, no, Minnesota, I'm sorry. He did but- then go take the Panthers. I'm sorry. Because yep. while he was at the Panthers, he gave Chuck Fletcher his first ever job in hockey. Uh, wow, isn't it crazy how he got hired as the general manager all these years later? Isn't that isn't that wild? What a crazy coincidence! By the by the way, the did, same did he did he maybe know Cliff a little bit? Maybe I think everybody knew Cliff, the Hall I, of Fame. Hello, right? Um, no, but I'll, I'll get I'll do you one further. Okay. How about Paul Holmgren? Paul Holmgren's got the same thing. He went to Hartford for like three years and then came back to Philly, and he's been there ever since. Right. Like hello. It, that's the point. Hello. Right. That that is the problem. And Briere and Pronger are not that. Now you can make the argument that Lindros is sure fine, but it's not the same thing if you're doing it differently. And I, if you. I, I, Clean it out think, from the top. I think it's a whole different animal. I think there's something to be said too for guys who played a little bit more recently and then understand a little, like especially post if you were one lockout. of those, post well, lockout. Especially, especially in Briere's case because Briere finishing his career, I believe his last year in the league was 2013-14. Something like that. Because yeah. by that point, the buyout happened in, in Philly. He played the one year in Montreal. He played one year in Colorado, and that was the end of that. And in that particular time, you're getting a sense of where the game is going. I think the Briere could know, like, could understand where the game is at, what you I, I need agree. from a player standpoint. And I think the Pronger working for the league office is like kind of an, an interesting part of it too, because it means you know a lot of the inside stuff that goes on there. Right. So you really know stuff about the league. Now, another name that was floated on on that 32 thoughts hit on uh Hockey Night in Canada yeah. that I really find interesting. And again, it's a guy who is who played for the Flyers before, but he has he really so we're, has we're no, three for three for former no, no, Flyers. No, 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 but, hold on. Huh? But, but this is the guy, and we were talking about this pre-show a little bit because I because because you turn around, you even said somebody who, you know, if if the guy that they were to hire is under the age of 60, it's probably encouraging because it means they have a little bit clo- like it's a little bit closer to the current generation of the game, More right? More familiar with the modern product. Okay. So, and I told you that the guy that they mentioned is 45 years old. Okay. And he is an ex-flyer. An ex-flyer from a little while back, to be honest. Okay. And he hasn't had any connection to not only the flyers, but really, in a way, the NHL specifically in a long time. Do you have any idea who I'm talking about? Man, the only name that popped into my head, I don't think it's correct, but the only name that popped into my head is Patrick Sharp. 
No, it is not Patrick. Sharp. Okay, yeah. Who Which are we talking about? Although that we're talking about Robert Esch. Ooh, does Who, wait? Does he own a juniors team? No, he's the team president of the Utica Comets. In the oh, okay, NFL, okay, okay, okay. Which, okay, now let's play that. Let's play the game here. So he has a role that the Flyers are now looking to fill for an AHL team. He's held it for ten years, and that to me indicates you've got a background of running a hockey operations department, and you're getting to that point where maybe you know, hey, the and by the oh, by the way, who tweeted out? Hey, you know, Danny Briere and John Tortorella are two great guys who I like, like, in, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes, you know, things aren't done by coincidence. Let's just say that. So Robert Esch's name is out there. It's an interesting one. I just think it's interesting because of the fact that the second that I heard that name come out, it's like I knew exactly what his current job is. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. I know it he's an, and, I, and I know he's a former flyer, but – Put it aside for a second. He's worked in a completely different area, different league, and done this kind of job without, you know. So he's like, that's the difference between just assuming they're part of the old guard and not. You know what I mean? Like, yep. the last Fair thing, enough. like, there's an element where I actually, like, because another name that's been floated around is Ray Shero, and I knew that name was going to come up anyway because of the fact that he's not, he's not attached to anybody. He's, right. well, he, like, and he has well, the last name Shero. Well, hold on. <laughs> he's not attached to anybody formally. Like, guess guess where he's working. I'll give where? you one. No, I will give you one guess because it's it's pretty obvious when Is you it think still the Devils. It. No, it's not the Devils anymore. Okay. It, it's ironic because the Flyers got Chuck Fletcher realistically. Oh, is it Minnesota? From, yeah. The Flyers realistically got <laughs> Chuck Fletcher from the Devils, where he was a senior advisor at the time. A senior advisor to. Ray Shiro. You know, the Devils, the Wild, and the Flyers all have a, a <laughs> weird little, little creepy, dynamic going yeah, on. But triangle. But, but see, but that makes, like, Shiro's 60, and Shiro is, you know, okay, and his last name is the same as the head coach that won two Stanley Cups, which means that, hey, by the way, you know what he was doing in the 70s? Bopping around with, you know, hey, with dad at, at, well, while Clarkie's playing and Bill Barber's playing. And, you know, so that's a little bit more of what I think people are afraid of compared to these other guys who played for the Flyers for a period, but then went somewhere else and did something else and worked and did other things. Even Briere, who, okay, Briere came back was a, you know, when he retired, Briere was around the flyers in terms of being in the building but not you know like he worked for the main mariners and that was the only thing that, that, that the main mariners and the flyers had in common was they were owned by the same entity yep. they were not connected in terms of, like it wasn't a direct affiliate it wasn't like hey danny briere you're a pipeline right, right you're picking you you have players that we're gonna call up to the next level at some point it wasn't the flyers ECHL to, team right. exactly and i think that that but i think that that matters a little bit so you know, but we'll see. I mean, there's interesting names all over the place. Now you got to figure out how far it goes. And, and you know, th the key thing that Briere also said in this whole thing was he finally went again. He went where Chuck Fletcher would never go, which is rebuild. Rebuild. He said, you know, he, again, he confirmed the multi-year process thing. But and, and Briere said exactly what I've said on this show for a long time. It, it doesn't, doesn't to have to be a fire sale. Yep. And he's right. But I think that the noise, like, and listen, the noise is only going to get louder as we get closer to the off season with the who stays, who goes, how do you go about doing this? It's not a quick fix. And Briere said that, and he knows it. And perhaps the hardest part of what really is going to be done within this structure isn't the part where you got to draft people, and it isn't the part where you got to develop your players. It's how do you shed the cap? How do you shed the money and the term that Chuck Fletcher gave out, or at least that Chuck Fletcher's name was attached to all of these yep. years. How do you get rid of that? And I think that there's some contracts that you're going to be able to move maybe as soon as this offseason. Like, I can see them moving the Kevin Hayes contract in the offseason. I can see them moving the Ivan Provorov contract in the offseason. You want to talk about Carter Hart? I can see it being floated. I can see Travis Konechny finding a way to be floated because you got to start thinking long-term picture over just because Tortorella likes a guy today. You got to think bigger picture. But there's going to be a big but there's going to be a big difference between moving what's left of Kevin Hayes contract versus hey, you know what? 
I'm not sure if Travis Sanheim fits the picture, but we just signed him to an eight-year extension. We got to move this guy. You know yeah. what I mean? Question for you. Sure. 28 months from now, approximately two and a half years, we're in the summer of 2025. <laughs> okay. Is Scott Lawton still on the Philadelphia Flyers roster? Wow. At that at that point in the summer of twenty five, he will have one more year left at three million dollars, and then he'll be a UFA. I'm gonna say he will, but then you're facing a critical decision at that point, like in, as the season progresses. Because if you're not out of this build, and I don't think they will be, but if you're not out right. of this build by that point, then you're still gonna be doing the sales and at the theoretically, at, he's at the your deadline. he's your value move, right? Like, okay. like you know. Lawton's a type of guy who, at his contract level, could be sold in the offseason as soon as this year. I agree. I just think that they respect his potential leadership, especially... Like, I also agree with that. Yeah. I think, I think, and I think that, you know what, I think Lawton's going to... Like, we, we talked about with Carter Hart. you got to ask the question, do you want to spend your prime years going through a rebuild, or do you want to go to play for a contender? And if the answer, like, if the answer is, do you want to go through a rebuild in your prime years of your career as a goalie, and the answer is no... I think you have to explore moving him. I agree. But I can see Lawton saying the opposite. I can see Lawton I saying, agree. I want to be here. I'll do it. Yeah, I, I want to be here. And I and, could see him being a guy that you ship off two months before his contract expires, maximize value, because he's built for the playoffs. He's built sure. to play on the fourth line of a playoff team. And then he comes right back and resigns in the offseason. He's not he's not a, he's not the exact same as in terms of like he's got a little like I'm not saying he doesn't have snarl to his game. He does, but but not this level of snarl, but I like I almost picture a, a team that would acquire him doing it in the same way that Boston got Garnet Hathaway. Like I feel Fair. like like when if somebody picks him up at a deadline, the move is gonna feel like that it's, where you're shoring up the bottom six and saying it feels like the Jacob Vrana edition. I think it's a little no. I still think it's a little bit more towards oh, more the half place. Okay, well, because I, think, I because I think you get you go and you say he can produce offensively if you give him some players around him, and you know which on a good playoff team should be the case, and he can add some edge and some physicality and some snarl to a team. Like if you put him into a, the middle of a playoff race, do you think he's not going to go out there and hit everything that moves and then score a little bit while he's at it? He is because he's he's that energized into the game. But for the Absolutely. time being, I think his answer is going to be, "I'm here for this." I'm here, yep. And and I uh, yeah, look, I think we're too far down the line. He's got a point. chance to wear a C. Well, I was about to go there. I was going to yep. say, I think we're too far down the line this year for Tortorella to say, "Yeah, I'll, I'll name a captain this year." But I think next year he's got it. A hundred percent. If they decide to name a captain, and they might choose not to, just because they're rebuilding, and maybe you want to take a year. No, I don't. I don't buy but if that. They, if they name a captain, and I do think they will, I'm pretty sure it's Scott. I don't, and I don't buy. Yeah, I, that's why I don't buy that at all. Like, I think they absolutely will because I think that the key to this year was Tortorella knew nobody, and to sit there and sit, like when Tortorella sits there and goes, "I got to learn about everybody." Like now, I think he looks at Lawton and says, "That's my veteran leader." I got like yep. Scott Lawton on this team right now, and and I think that there's almost there there may be even a few parallels here between what Tor Tortorella did in his previous job. Scott Lawton is is Tortorella's Nick Felino at this given moment. Okay, you know, like, Fair enough. like he's not he's not your best player, and he's never going to be your best player. But he's but he's your veteran leader who's going to try to show people the ropes, and I think that, right. that matters. I want some predictions from you. I'm going to rattle off some names. Yeah, let's get you into it. You tell me in in 18 months. So after this off season, okay. next trade deadline, next off season, in 18 months, are they still on the team? Okay. Kevin I, I, can't, I, I can't wait to revisit. Well, I can't wait to revisit this in a few months and see how wrong I am. On oh, yeah. Let's go ahead. Um, so Kevin Hayes feels like an easy one. Yeah, he's gone. I think okay. this offseason. I agree. Uh, Ivan Provorov. Uh, also, I think gone and a good chance this offseason. I really okay. think that, that, you know what? There's too much. Both of those names that you just started with, which are, I think you started with for an obvious reason, because there's that much smoke around them right now. Yep. And and where there is smoke, you know the rest. So I agree. I think that there's too much going on right now with them. I think this offseason is big for those two. Carter Hart. So you said this offseason. That would trade, require next a contract month. extension out of Carter Hart. It would. Um, it's tough. Like I, it's tough to sit. Like it's tough to predict what what's going to happen. 
can I say what should? I think rebuild says he's gone. Well, I was about to say, can I say what should happen? Next trade deadline. Yes. I think you can get a friggin' haul for him with a I, year and a half left. Eat half the salary. Who cares? Well, next next. Oh season, no, next season's the last year. Okay, right, yeah, I'm sorry. Next, Eat half the salary. Who cares? You can get Carter Hart, especially if he plays at all decent next season, for under two million dollars for a playoff run. I think if and listen, I think. Look, I, I unless like, unless Buffalo throws a couple first round picks at you this off season, I I think next trade deadline's the way to go. I think that, um, I think that the thing with Carter Hart is this: if you're, I look, I like to think that I know what I'm talking about when we come on and do shows like this, and when I watch as many games as I do, and I certainly know that there's people who work in the hockey operation side of things around the league that are definitely smarter than me. If you've paid any close attention, you don't let the record and the goals against fool you. And no. you see that Carter Hart has stolen this team with, with this team with the defense the way it is, with the talent the way that it is, and he's stolen games. I I'm think telling you, you, he's getting you way too many points. If you can move him this offseason, you move him this offseason. So, but I think, you, I think you have to acknowledge that part of it. You have to Absolutely. acknowledge if you're smart enough in the game, you have to acknowledge that don't let the numbers fool you and don't let the numbers fool you next year either. Like, Car- whatever Carter Hart has been happens, spectacular. He's got it. He's he's got a you know. So I I think I think they should strongly consider okay. moving him. Um, I agree, and like you kind of alluded to earlier, I does think I do think it comes down to kind of a personal decision by the player on what he wants to do with right the bulk of the prime of his career. Um, Travis Konechny. <sighs> wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, because because here's the thing. It's a deal. It's a contract. Well, it's not just that. It's I'm not sure what's like for him. I'm not sure what's going to happen this off season because let's be clear about something. He's won Tortorella over a lot. Oh yeah. From game six, benching him for an entire third period of a game that was still winnable, and he's been your and he's he was already one of your best players for the first five. Just flat out sit down. You're done for the night. And then he's responded so well that Tortorella is at the point where he knows that's his most skilled player. I think Travis Konechny um, ate a lot of fertilizer this year that's behind good, the scenes. And that I think, is a really good that is a really good and radio friendly way to put it. Thank and you. I, I yeah, and I I think he took his medicine and has really grown up and. I think that if Travis Konechny stays, I think he's a guy that you try to you try to time your rebuild so you get him one before he's gone. Something that's important about him right now is a and I, I, look, I assume that Briere has some affinity with him because it seems you know, Bri, okay, Briere's not as or as a player, Briere was not as chippy of a guy as Konechny is, but from a scoring standpoint, there's similarities. I feel like they played the same role to Claude Giroux. A little bit. Travis Konechny and Daniel Briere were Travis were Claude Giroux's line mates. To an, yeah, certainly to an extent. I understand where you're coming from with that. And here's what, but what I'm trying to get is that I, I think that, like, I don't know where Briere's affinity with him is. I, and like, I, I just mean I think they understand each other. Oh, yeah, I got On you. that shared level. I'm just, I'm just saying I don't know where Briere's affinity is with Konechny because we haven't – like, he wouldn't go into specifics with names today, and I understand why of he's course. doing that. He's being close to the card. Especially, close to the he can't do anything for six weeks anyway. Right, like, you don't no, give away, you don't show yep. your hand this early. I get no that. reason. Yep. But it's clear what Tortorella thinks of him, and because of that, that's what made like he he's another Konechny's another tough case of what's the right thing to do versus whether or not he wants to be here. Cause I think he wants and what to be does the player want to do. Well, I right. think, I, well, I think he wants to be here. And I think that the two most important people in the organization at this given moment, which is Briere and Tortorella, I think that they really like him and would keep, would keep him if the situation was right. But what you have to ask yourself is again, proactive, reactive, big picture thinking, what are you know? What's the best thing for the Flyers and Travis Konechny combined? Right. Is it get is it get Konechny to a team that should have a better shot of winning because you're not there yet? And oh well, by the that's way, Konechny, what I was and, say. and oh by the way, yeah. Konechny can probably fetch you one of the bigger returns you're going to get. 
what do you do? Well, and I it's, said that you know, I said that eighteen month timeline for a reason. At that point, Connecting will have one year left at five and a half. And obviously, we expect the cap to jump a little bit. So, you know, that's a pretty tolerable cap hit. And if the but Flyers, still, well, and if the Flyers aren't ready to kind of take that step forward, right. I think if they're ready to take that step forward, I think you go into the season with Konechny kind of in a Dylan Larkin type situation where you're, you're either making a run trying to resign him or you're shipping him off. Because I, honestly, I, I think that's where Detroit was this year, to be honest with you. That's fair. Um, um, all right. So, who else you got? Uh, well, I got two more, but real quick on Travis Konechny. But. If he's willing to stay, if they're making the, I'm sorry, if they're not making the run and they decide to ship him out at that point, you're going right. to get a haul. You're going to get a monstrous haul for him. All right. Uh, two more names. Yep. Um, Travis Sanheim, the other Travis. Okay, so the tough, the tough part I'm having with this one is, is the contract. The, yes, because that's this is the, this is one of the bigger challenges that Briere or whomever the next full time general manager in, in is going to have. In eighteen months left, in eighteen months there will still be seven years left on that deal. I just don't know if I see the move in it. I think I, don't, a, I agree. It's I think it's a tough sell today. I think it's gonna like when you know what when you get that contract into the Kevin Hayes territory today, it's an easier sell. Because if you can sit there and hand a team, all right, listen, three years at six and like six two five, with the way you know by the, which by the time it gets there, the cap's going to be really different. So like, all right, I think you've got something there, but I don't think, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. I think it's a tough sell. I agree. Uh, the last name on my list. Yep. Any guesses? Well, it's not going to be. It, it doesn't seem like it's anybody who's super young. You're not going there. Um. I mean, not unless you're going to hit me with, um, oh goodness, who the hell, who the hell else am I thinking of here? Uh, I'm, try, last, uh, I'm trying to piece on, through the lineup. Are you going to hit me with Owen Tippett? The last name on my list in 18 months, Kevin. Yeah. Is Joel Farabee a Philadelphia Flyer? Oh, in 18 months. We've already gotten early word that he. It doesn't seem like he's very interested in losing. <laughs> I I think there's a better you know there's a better chance than Sanheim. There may be a better chance than Konechny. That he's I mean, gone, you mean? Yes. Okay. I mean, look, I, I th- here's the hard part. It's closer to Sanheim in terms of difficulty to move. Okay. But you also may have a player who, if he gets to wit's end about it, just, you know, listen, this might be one of those ones where you have to bite the bullet on the player doesn't want it anymore and you just have to get what you get. So I think that that might come to a head because the, I mean the nice the nice thing is the Flyers are going to be nowhere near the salary cap, so they will not at any point be uh, incentivized to move the contract. So if he gets that unhappy, he just kind of has to deal with it. What I'm interested to see is you know because uh, I don't really think I don't think anybody's like you can't eat money on that contract right now. So no, no one's gonna no one's gonna take it at five million dollars with the season that he's had. No one's no. doing that. So he's he's going to be here at the start of next and year, whether he likes the, it or not. And for the record, I think you'd be selling at an extraordinarily low oh, for sure. on Joel I, Farabee right now. I think he's here next year, whether he likes it or not. But then as you move forward, like like you lumped in and you you strategically did this with this. This offseason, next trade deadline, next offseason. Then, like... Because that's that, to me, is Danny Briere's first impression. Here, yes, that's first that's impression. his... Um, his probation period where I'm not going to say you can't question his moves, but I think 18 months is his yeah. entry period. That's fair. His grace and period. I, and that's good. Th- th- those are all, every name you mentioned is a very legitimate name to mention. And there's a lot of conversation to be had. So, uh, you know, as we kind of bring probably up, more, we can talk about later. Oh, there's going to be way more. And, and oh, listen, yeah. uh, this is the thing we've got, well, I guess four more weeks of the season left. And that's, what's going to be talked about, right? Yep. Like this is what's left to talk about. So as we kind of put like, we, as we put a bow on more than just this show, put a bow on the Chuck Fletcher era. We don't have to talk about him anymore after this. But there's, yeah, there's 16 games left, and quite frankly, lose all of them. Well, I, to an extent, I don't think they're going to have a problem with that on some night. <laughs> right. Who they're playing. I mean, you got this week in particular. You got Vegas and Carolina, so. Let's uh, you know see how this. Oh, looks Carolina's another... having some trouble scoring goals over the last. Couple and so of was days. yeah. Guess what? So was Tampa, and Tampa came yeah. in and steamrolled. You're ready to put up eight spots against the Flyers. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I think we should get out of here. It's been a long yep. show. We had a lot Absolutely. to talk about, and it's time. 
It is. It's, We've been here been, for a while. It's been a, but it's been a great show because of I think where we are. Like it's been one of the most positive shows I think we've had in a little while, just because there's been, there's a, you know what, the wheels are back in motion. There's yep. a, there's, there's a pulse again. And and you know I think the Danny Briere availability on Sunday morning really did a lot for that because I think the general oh, I consensus, think it helped, yeah. the general consensus twenty four hours ago was, okay, Chuck's gone, but so what. And Danny Breer coming out and just openly saying rebuild several times. It, it, yep. Yeah. It's, it's, there's, the Philadelphia Flyers are a different organization today than they were 72 hours ago. For they, sure. They feel different. Yep. And the only way, but still, again, the only way you're going to drive the point home is with what happens after the yep. season's over. I, well, and I won't believe it until I say it. Exactly. Yep. And that's why, and that's why I hesitated with, okay, what's big? What's significant? Yep. Like, are we talking about rearranging the deck chairs again on the Titanic? Because if we are, then there's no reason to be positive yet. But we're gonna yep. get there. So let's. Yep. Uh, and uh, we'll get we'll get out of here. Um, we will be back next week to talk about Danny Briere's first full week as Flyers general manager or yep. interim general manager, whatever. You know what? I, uh, yeah, we know what you mean. In the meantime, if anything happens, you're gonna follow Kevin on Twitter at Kevin underscore Durso. Make sure to follow the show at YWT Podcast. Uh, you can also find the show everywhere you find your podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, Podbean, iTunes, Google Podcasts, sportstalkphilly.com. We're everywhere. Yeah, subscribe you to our, there. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Comment. Let us know. Hit the like button. Um, we're going to get out of here. We'll be back next week. And, uh, man, one down. See ya. <laughs>